Hi, my name is Keith Cooper and uh, in this short video I'm going to address a few issues about black and white photography and printing. Uh, this is really just a quick set of tips. Uh, it came about because someone recently asked me and they said, can you give me some quick tips to improving black and white photography? And I thought about it and I thought there's, there's quite a few things I would cover. I've written articles about it, all kinds of stuff. Got loads of stuff on the Northlight Images website. But what sort of things could I just say, well, this makes a difference. Um, and in makes a difference, that applies if you think about the things I'm gonna mention and decide they're for you or decide they're not for you. It's thinking about it is the key thing. So anyway, a simple one. And this is perhaps uh, the difference between colour and black and white. And I found it takes people quite a while to get used to it. Uh, once you do get used to it, you don't even notice you're doing it. And that is to think of shadows, particularly deep shadows, as objects in your composition. Now, this is very similar to the idea of negative space in composition, where what isn't there and the shape of what isn't there is as important as what is there. But in black and white, it's much easier just to say, think of, sub of uh, shadows as real things, as objects, because that's how they can look. Now, it depends on how you're doing it and uh, how you produce your images. And I'm not going to go through vast, great collections of, you know, this is point A, this is point B. These are just ideas of ways which you can just gently improve things or think more about black and white. Um, shot here I took under the Humber Bridge. Now, the bridge itself is obviously an object. It splits the composition. Now, in this one, I deliberately chose, when I printed this, to actually offset the image of the uh, bridge, which is in shadow, the underneath of the bridge, to offset that, set that slightly from the center axis because it gives a slight feel of imbalance and makes the whole shape look slightly more menacing, particularly if you've ever seen the uh, start of Star Wars, uh, which is what I thought of when I was underneath there. That's a panoramic shot, multiple shots stitched together. But that, some of the composition of that came about after I took the photos, stitched them together, and then thought, what composition works best? So shadows as objects when you're taking things, but don't be afraid to take photos perhaps slightly wider than you originally wanted, uh, particularly with today's high megapixel cameras, you can crop uh, quite reasonably. There's nothing wrong in cropping to a particular shape if you want to. There are, there are no prizes for, for using the entire frame of, uh, of the camera. Um, you know, people who used to improve on prints include sort of rebate marks on the edge of the film uh, like that. Uh, look, I used the whole film frame for this. Well, good for you. Uh, go, go, you know, get yourself a prize for it. Um, cut snow ice for me. It was always an affectation from my front when I saw it. Um, yeah, sure, if it was a contact print, you expect it because it has the frame numbers on it and it's useful. But actually doing it as a large print, yeah, no, not really. It sort of says the picture itself isn't good enough, so I need to add frippery around the edges to make it better. Mm. Like most of these things, your mileage may vary, you may choose otherwise, but at least you've thought about it. Second, I, I mean, you know, take lots more photos for black and white and experiment. Um, somebody said, yeah, you know, what's the simplest way to take better photos? Take more photos. That applies for black and white as well. But actually think about them as black and white images. So, you know, even, and here's another one, pause to think about them as prints. Now, when I took this picture in uh, Wells Cathedral, I was very much aware of photos taken uh, 1905 by F.H. Evans of from the same place, however, with a much narrower field of view. Um, I was thinking of this as a print whilst I was looking through the viewfinder, framing it up. Um, that was always intended as a print. Um, the actual whys and wherefores of the exposure and things, well, that's, that's a technical issue. But in, I was thinking of that as a print. Likewise, the pictures of the uh, Aspen trunks here. Uh, 
Now, I've looked at how you change the tonality of these to get the effect, and that varies with uh, print size. So this needs processing differently if it is a six foot by four foot print to processing if it's a smaller print like this on A3 plus paper. So it makes a difference. Think about the print. And for a moment, when you take the picture, think, is this gonna go look good as a print? Well, if it obviously you think, yes, this is, then great, go ahead. If you think it might, we'll take the picture anyway. It costs you nothing extra. Look at the picture but when you get back. If you then think the picture, mm, perhaps that won't make a print, even if I crop it. No, it still doesn't make a print. Have a thought as to why that doesn't make a print. Because thinking about printing when you take the picture is great. Opening the picture, looking at it, and deciding not to make a print of it is also important because that also can teach you something about what you think makes a good print. And when it comes down to it, it's what you think makes a good print. Now, I've got boxes and boxes of prints all over the place. I uh, store them in uh, various drawers and it's a side effect of doing lots of printer testing. I've got a few I'm happy to put on the walls, others not. And I know why I'm not happy to put them on the walls. I've thought about it and so Anyway, enough of the sort of conceptual sort of when you're taking the pictures, what about the tech of it? What about actually taking pictures? Well, for black and white, I always shoot raw and I then convert to black and white. Now, I don't use presets. Um, there's someone else's vision. I want my own vision. I want to experiment. Presets in software are great to flick through and have a look and think, well, oh, that's interesting, or, whoa, that looks awful. Don't be afraid of looking at a preset or something that someone well-known and famous has produced, because they're selling them to make money, um, and go, oh, that looks awful. It looks dreadful. It looks really naff. There is nothing wrong with saying that, you know, that an effect looks bad. You're thinking critically about it. In fact, if you find an effect that you really, really dislike, think about why you don't like it. I really dislike HDR style photos for color. Never have liked it. It's because it doesn't fit with my perception of a scene when I took the photo. It's overly processed. In other words, the, you know, the processing itself is going, hey, look at me, look at all these smart tricks. It's not looking at the underlying image. And to me, that's important. It's what's underneath it that counts. Now, there are tricks, compositional methods, which you can make things look more interesting. But when it comes down to it, a rubbish photo is a rubbish photo. It's rarely possible to get a good print from a rubbish photo. It's quite easy to get a rubbish print from what actually is quite a good photo just by bad choices in how you produce it. But anyway, as I said, shoot in RAW because you're capturing as much of your camera information as possible. When you convert to color, uh, from color to black and white, choose a large work, if you're doing a Photoshop, choose a large color space, something like Pro Photo. It doesn't matter that even a good monitor like this can't display all the colors of the pro photo uh, image space. It doesn't matter one jot if you can't see the colors. What you're looking at is converting those colors to black and white. And I've got lots of stuff on the Northlight site about converting from color to black and white. But the more colors you capture, the more variation you can have in tonality when you convert to black and white. So it's not throwing information away. So you go for the absolute highest quality for raw, uh, taking your photographs using raw format, converting them to color in something like Pro Photo, 16 bit as well, because gradations working in 8 bit can easily show up in prints when they're converted to you know, problems in skies, a bit of banding or something like that, which you don't want. So you've got the photos. One other bit, when you're photograph making photos and you know they're going to be for black and white, don't worry too much about a little bit of overexposure. Uh, you don't want to clip highlights, but you basically want to up the exposure. So I've got an example of producing a black and white print from a, uh, the, you know, from a color photo, a fully worked example that goes right through the whole process. I've got a video of it and I've got a, uh, a you know, print and a written article about it. 
That picture, I knew it was going to be black and white at the time. I slightly overexposed it uh, when I took the colour pictures because I knew they were going to make uh, black and white. Now, this is partly because a few years ago and the camera technology had a lot more noise in the shadows. You've got much more freedom, you've got much more dynamic range these days with good cameras. So you still, it can help sometimes if you just think this is for black and white, just a little bit more exposure. It doesn't matter if the colours are slightly washed out, you just don't want to clip. And that's the whole point of it for, for doing that. When you've produced your black and white image, yeah, and this at this point it could be scan film even, it doesn't really matter, you're editing it. Look at your whole workflow. Look at how you print. Now, this is an Epson P700 pigment ink printer. This is particularly good for black and white. Um, it, it works, it, the black and white pictures look black and white under most lighting. Now, with video, there may be a slight tonal, uh, you might see a slight tint here, but it's not real. These are bang on neutral. And, you know, I usually will try and get my prints to look bang on neutral. Pigment inks help. It's possible with dye-based printers to produce good looking black and white. And I've got examples of almost all of my printer reviews that do look at printing black and white. So if you've got a printer and I've reviewed it, then almost certainly I've got a, uh, another video, an article that looks at aspects of printing black and white because it's an important part of printing for me. Now, you've looked at your workflow, there you go, that's your whole process. Are there any things I wouldn't do? Now, these are very much personal things. Um, filters. I use filters this is physical filters on the front of your lens. I use them very sparingly. In a way, if I can see that a filter has been used, particularly a graduated filter or something like that, then it's been overused. I do not want to look at a picture and think, oh, wonder what filter they were using. I don't want to think that. That immediately distracts me from the image. Now, that's one of the things you know, I, it happens to me because I'm a photographer, because I know these things, I look for them, but the problem is once you've seen them, you can't unsee them. So yeah, filters, graduated filters, very subtly used if used at all. Modern cameras have the dynamic range to capture an awful lot, particularly for black and white. Um, and in some ways it's easier with black and white not to bother using the filters. But if I can see you know, an obvious gra gra graduated filter use, no, I don't like it. Polarizers, similarly use them with care. They can increase contrast of cloud. They can, with buildings, they can control reflections and things like that. So they do have a use. But be careful if you use you know, polarizers on wide angle lenses. I looked at this when I tested the Canon R5 and there are potential issues with that because with wide angle lenses, the polarization of the skylight varies where you're looking. So you get gradations in the skies, which we don't see and which I don't want in my photo. So use things like polarizers with care and if you're unsure, take a picture with the polarizer and one without. Um, you've not lost anything really. Certainly if you're, you're not in a hurry, then you know, just try that and see. And see how they work, how the images work through, how they fit your style. Now, generally I hate the word style for pictures because it, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, it's beloved of people who have to write essays about photographers. And in the real world, most photographers really don't care about stuff like that. Now, commercially, if you're selling stuff, then a style may be a useful marketing adjunct. But it's a marketing adjunct. Don't believe your own publicity too much. Look for what you want to show in your images and go that way with it. Um, I've, I've got thousands of black and white images and I'm not going to go through stuff here. Just go, well, this is, uh, this is what I did here. This is, uh, I've got some examples of that because I know people do like it. But in general, I'd rather concentrate on the principles for it. A couple of others, things that I don't like. I mentioned that I want bang on neutral for black and white. And I do want black and white. I do not want toned or tinted. I have rarely, and this is over the years of looking at hundreds of thousands of pictures, 
I have rarely seen a toned or tinted black and white print where I thought the toning or tinting truly benefited the print. To my mind, toning and tinting is all too often used as a bit of a sideshow uh, to detract from the image itself. Um, Save so you looking too much at it. Uh, much like adding the camera film rebate along the edge of shots. It's there, um, it gets in the way. Now, to me, I don't mind a, a slight change in tone. So, for example, this paper here, this is a matte paper. Uh, it's a matte art paper. It's a bright white paper. This one is also, this is on a luster type paper. It's also relatively bright white. For some subjects, um, so, some architectural subjects and some natural subjects, I find a slightly warmer paper suits the image better. But we're talking at the level of difference of colour of paper. We are not talking toning the actual image or tinting it itself. Now, you may like tone or tinted prints. Great, um, I don't. Um, these are my tips, so there you go. Choo choose what you want for it. But yeah, beware of you applying tricks, much like HDR and things like that, and film rebates, in an attempt to make the picture more interesting. If the picture is good enough, and it does come down to the image itself, the technical stuff is nice, but it's the image itself. If the image itself is good enough, people will look at that and they will stop and look at it. And there's nothing better for me in an exhibition than seeing somebody walk past a row of pictures and then just stop and look at a particular picture and spend 10 seconds, 20, 30 seconds, a minute, just looking at a picture. Now, I've no way of knowing why that's important to them. But to me, it's one of the best things about an exhibition is seeing somebody totally lost for a moment or two just looking at one of your images. That, to me, is a great picture. Now, the next person who walks along may walk right past it. Uh, I take no offence at that. Um, if they walk right past the lot, I think, mm, well, OK, at least they came in the door. Yeah, so it's OK that way. I'll finish off with one other bit, and people say this is about landscape as well, so this applies to colour as well. People say, you should slow down your work, you should stop and think. Well, yes, thinking, I mentioned the stuff about, um, about looking at, uh, visualising a picture as a print, thinking about it as a black and white print, slowing down a lot, that to me, it breaks the moment. Uh, photography for me, even if it is something like this scene here, where I could have sat around for 10 minutes looking at these trees, and I've spent quite a lot of time looking at aspens in Colorado. I could have sat there and looked at it and just lined it up. And, yeah. No. I saw it, I thought about it, thought that would make a good black and white print. Where's, is there a better place to stand? Is there a better angle? Or do I like this one that's just grabbed my attention? No, I like this one here. Click, we've got a picture. I might take a few other pictures and when I look at the pictures when I get back, a good picture is often the first of a sequence. Now, sometimes I will actually look about it and think about it and the last picture is the one where you think you've got it right. But even then it's only taken a few minutes. I've not gone in for any great deep thought about what there is. This, I was on a way to a job. I'd never been uh, by the Humber Bridge. I stopped off, went down to the beach underneath it and had a look round. It was an interesting day. I took loads of photos. Not for any reason other than I thought, well, I've never seen this bridge before. Um, will it make an interesting picture? Yeah, I think it will. Um, it does. This looks much better as a six foot long print. As a six foot long print, this one really does get people to stop and look at it because it has much more feeling of uh, an Imperial Star Destroyer or whatever they were at the start of, uh, of, uh, at the start of Star Wars. Uh, so that's where that is. But hopefully that gives you a bit of a few ideas for black and white photography. 
Um, I've got lots more stuff like this. This really was just something that came from somebody asking me, can you give me some quick tips as to what really matters for you for black and white? Hopefully it's of interest. Uh, let me know in the comments and the likes. I've got lots more stuff on photography itself, as well as the technical side of cameras, lenses, printers, monitors, and things like that. It is, they are all about the photography when it comes to it. So I hope this has been of some interest and uh, thank you for watching. Oh, and please do subscribe to the channel if you find it interesting. Thank you.